Hello and welcome to Chicago Reacts, Americans Learn. My name is Colin, and today I'm watching Napoleon's Retreat from Moscow, 1812. Uh, this is, of course, from the one and only Epic History TV YouTube channel. And uh, if you haven't uh, seen any of the other videos leading up to it, this is one in a line of several videos I've reacted to from Epic History TV regarding the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, as I, They've all been chronological at this point so if you i don't know want to get caught up on everything uh go back and and watch those previous videos and uh then come back um but yeah uh we're several years now into the war i you know i've been been waiting for napoleon to get his comeuppance this video is going to be about his retreat from moscow I don't know enough about the Napoleonic Wars to know for certain if this is the like the end for Napoleon or just like the beginning of the end. Cuz I know he he has had some pretty major losses in Spain, you know. So, I don't know what was technically the uh what people consider what historians consider the uh beginning of the end. Napoleon, but yeah, been waiting, been waiting for him to get his. I don't know. I was about to say something. I, I don't know how far are we into the video here. Sometimes you can't swear at it by a certain point <laughs> in the video. I was, was get his butt handed to him. Was what I was gonna say, but you know, in a more fun way. <laughs> um. So yeah, I think that's enough of an intro. Uh, be sure to like, share, and subscribe if you haven't already. And uh, with that being said, ooh, let's bring the cam display up and let's let's get into it. Mm. Russia, eighteen twelve. Napoleon invades his former ally with the largest army Europe has ever seen. Wait. So these are names of cities. Wait. White. Napoleon. In is White Russia the name of a place? Like, is that, is that what the drink is named after? The White Russian? Or is the White Russian just a White Russian because it's vodka and, was it like half and half or something like that? I've never, I don't think I've ever had one, but it's what the dude drinks. I don't know. I didn't know that there was a place called White Russia. Interesting. Invades his former ally with the largest army Europe has ever seen. But for the French Emperor, the decisive blow remains frustratingly beyond reach. Russia's resilience is unlike anything he's ever encountered. And as winter closes in, his army begins the most infamous retreat in history. The 15th of September, 1812. 83 days after invading Russia, a week after his costly victory at Borodino, Napoleon entered Moscow. He expected to be greeted by dignitaries, formally offering the city's surrender. Instead, he discovered that 90% of Moscow's inhabitants had fled. A fire had started the previous night and was blamed on drunken soldiers. But over the next 48 hours, fires continued to break out across Moscow mm. until most of the city was ablaze. Count Fyodor Rostopchin, the city's governor, had ordered that Moscow be destroyed rather than allowed to fall into enemy hands. And now fires were being started deliberately by Russian criminals, freed from jail and acting on police orders. French soldiers rounded up and shot any they could catch. But the inferno was impossible to contain. In four days, 
two-thirds of Moscow was destroyed. With the fires finally under control, Napoleon's soldiers turned their attention to systematically looting the ruined city. While from his new quarters in the Kremlin, Napoleon sent a letter to Emperor Alexander in St. Petersburg, inviting him to make peace and end the war. He received no reply. Napoleon waited, confident that Alexander would eventually negotiate. But as the days passed, he grew increasingly uneasy. Cossack raids were disrupting his vital communications with Paris, as well as the arrival of supplies. While the steady attrition of French forces and Russian reinforcements meant Napoleon was outnumbered for the first time in the campaign. Rumours also reached him that his reluctant allies, Prussia and Austria, were in secret talks with his enemies. Napoleon had proposed that the army winter in Moscow, but that now looked too dangerous. Reluctantly, he accepted that the army would have to move back to Smolensk to find safe winter quarters. Napoleon knew how severe Russian winters could be, but continued to put off his departure, reassured by fine October weather, and hoping that at the last minute there might be a message from Alexander offering peace. It never came. On the 13th of October, the first light snow fell. Five days later, Kutuzov launched a surprise attack on Murad's advance guard at Vinkova and defeated it. Napoleon, stung into action, gave the order for the army to leave Moscow the next day. Our video sponsor, the legendary World of Tanks, is the home of online multiplayer Armoured Mayhem. This game has more than 550 carefully researched historic tanks, all of which can be blown to pieces across 40 stunning but highly lethal battlefields. World of Tanks is offering new recruits who use the link in our video description and the code TANKTASTIC a sign-up <laughs> bonus of a premium light tank, 500 gold, and 7 days premium access. A handy head start as you enter the fray and figure out your own tactical style. Fearless Kamikaze Assault, or Ice Cold Hull Down Sniper. Thank you to World of Tanks for supporting this video. <laughs> that kind of looks like a fun game to blow off some steam. Just blow shit up. Why not? One hundred thousand men of the Grand Armée left Moscow in a column ten miles long, with an estimated mm. forty thousand carriages and carts. There were women and children too, army wives and the vivandières, the women who cooked for the soldiers, as well as some civilians. Every wagon and pack was stuffed with as much food and loot as possible. As he set off, Sergeant Bourgogne of the Imperial Guard made an inventory of his pack. It contained several pounds of sugar, some rice, some biscuit, half a bottle of liqueur, a woman's Chinese silk dress embroidered in gold and silver, several gold and silver ornaments, amongst them a piece of the cross of Ivan the Great. Besides these, I had my uniform, a woman's large riding cloak, two silver pictures in relief, 12 inches long and 8 high, all in the finest workmanship. Also several lockets, and a Russian prince's spittoon, set with precious stones. I wore over my shirt a yellow silk waistcoat, which I had made myself out of a woman's skirt. Over that, a large cape lined with ermine, and a large pouch, hung at my side by a silver cord. This was full of various things, amongst them a crucifix in gold and silver, and a little Chinese porcelain vase. Then there were my firearms, powder flask, and 60 cartridges in the box. This heavily encumbered army did not yet realise it was in a race against time. The Russians were beginning to move against the flanks of Napoleon's 550-mile-deep salient. 
That very day, Wittgenstein's army was driving back Marshal Saint-Cyr's outnumbered force at Polatsk, and drawing Victor's IX Corps west to support them. In the south, Admiral Chichagov's advance had Schwarzenberg's Austrian Corps falling back to cover Warsaw. The corridor was closing. And then there was the weather. Though Napoleon was confident his army could reach winter quarters in Smolensk in 20 days, well before the more extreme temperatures were due to hit. Napoleon planned to withdraw via Kaluga, through unspoilt country where the army could forage for supplies. <coughs> but Kutuzov sent General Dokturov's 6th Corps to block the road at Malayaroslavets. In fierce fighting, Italian troops of Eugène's 4th Corps drove the Russians out of the town. It was a hard-won victory, reminiscent of the fighting at Borodino. Kutuzov now stood between Napoleon and Kaluga. Napoleon now took the Sorry, Napoleon's face in this painting is pretty, like... Well, I'm fucked. <laughs> That's what it looks like to me, anyway. Just want to point that out. The unusual step of conferring with his marshals. And after discussing various options, he decided that rather than seek another major battle, they would retreat the way they'd come. Along the Smolensk. Wait, also, this might be like a small thing to be commenting on as well, but I'm looking at the the candle holder on the table there. And it's got a, like a like a shade over it. Was that was that common? Did people put shades over candles? Like isn't that a fire hazard? Does that work? I don't know, I don't think I've ever seen that before. I assume it'd have to be made of something like metal or non-flammable, right? I don't know. That's like, it's a, it, that is a small, a small, like, mind-blown kind of thing. I, I had no idea. It, like, that sounds so stupid. Like, the more, more I talk about it out loud, but, like, I don't think I'd ever seen that before. Like, a lampshade over a candle. I think I've spent enough time on that. Let's keep going. It's road. Napoleon had hoped to avoid this route, as it meant marching back through country already stripped bare of supplies. The day after the fighting at Malayaroslavets, Napoleon was nearly captured by a group of Cossacks, and saved only by General Rapp's charge at the head of his escort. After this close shave, Napoleon had a file of poison made up, which he carried around his neck in case of capture. Anyone know what that poison was? Like, cyanide wasn't a thing yet, right? When was cyanide invented? I don't know. If anyone knows what kind of poison Napoleon had, or like what was a popular poison for people to carry on them in case of capture like this. Let me know in the comments. Thank you. Napoleon's army set off on its new course, shadowed at a respectful distance by Kutuzov's army to the south. They passed the old battlefield of Borodino, a grisly, unnerving sight, where crows pecked at half-buried corpses. Yeah. Probably didn't smell too good either. marching quickly began to tire out men and horses. A few days later, the temperature fell below freezing. Mm. The army's overworked, starving horses died en masse. Discipline began to break down, as some drivers simply dumped the sick and wounded by the roadside to try to ensure their own survival. As the French column became increasingly strung out, General Miloradovich, commanding Kutuzov's advance guard, fell on Davout's rearguard outside Vyazma, 
After a few hours, Davout's 1st Corps was cut off, until Eugène and Ney came to his rescue. The battle ended with street fighting in Vyazma, as the French hastily evacuated the burning town. For the soldiers of the Grande Armée, so unaccustomed to retreats and routs, Vyazma was an alarming, demoralising blow. On the 4th of November, it began to snow heavily. The next night, temperatures plummeted to minus 20 degrees centigrade. Few men or women had proper winter clothing or access to mm. shelter. Many froze to death overnight. God damn. The next like I, so I've, I've lived in Chicago now for two and a half years, or sorry. I don't know why I'm pausing so long to think of this. It's about been about a year and a half. I did live here previously for about a year and a half before I moved away. Anyway, came back, blah, blah, blah. I've only been outside during, like, negative degree weather. I mean, in Fahrenheit, you know, uh, like twice. This year, I think, I think it was also in November, um, I had to go to work. And I commute to work taking public transportation. So I had to walk to the red line, which is about a five, ten minute walk from my apartment. And then once I got off the red line to my place of work, which is another ten minute walk in negative five degree weather. And that was something. And I, I had access to modern thermal clothing. And that was uncomfortable. And I, I spent a total of 20 minutes max during that time like i survived like you know i think moving around i would not want to sleep outside that I, I would probably die like like many of these people did good lord yeah i just can't even imagine i, I can't even imagine just i only have a small taste of, of what that kind of temperature feels like and it's, it's bizarre. It's a weird feeling. It's really weird to be outside when it is that cold outside. It the air just is different. Yeah. This morning, wagons and guns were abandoned. Many soldiers sought to save themselves, ignoring officers, stealing horses and food, and leaving the column to scour the countryside for supplies. Many of these foragers were found by the Cossacks. Some cut down or lanced, others robbed of every possession and left to freeze. I. One thing I'm curious about now, like listening to this part here, how many um, journals, letters, diaries from soldiers who were here during this time, like that survived? Uh, the, the journals that survived from them, or just the writings from these soldiers that survived. Um, I wonder how many of these soldiers were writing about, like, contemplating their own mortality. I mean, just being, you know, in war itself, but, like, walking into a situation like this that would s s quickly start to seem very helpless. And just, like... When you're a soldier in one of these battles, like every day you wake up could be your last. That had to have been on the forefront of their of their minds, right? Am, or am, am I crazy? Like, I would be really interested to see um, if there are any surviving like letters from soldiers or diaries, or whatever, talking about their personal experiences during this, and if they were just contemplating life itself, you know? Hmm. If anyone knows of any that exist and, like, the resources for that, where to find them, let me know, please. Like, I think that'd be fascinating to read. 
In a few cases, they were handed over to peasants, eager for retribution against the foreign invaders who had plundered all they owned. As the army struggled on towards Smolensk through blizzards, Napoleon ordered Eugène's IV Corps to strike out for Vitebsk, where there were large French supply depots. But Vitebsk had already fallen to the Russians. IV Corps was too weak to fight its way through, and rejoined the army, minus its artillery and most of its baggage. A colonel who saw IV Corps at this stage described men without shoes, almost without clothes, exhausted and famished, sitting on their packs, sleeping on their knees, and only rousing themselves out of this stupor to grill slices of horse meat Ugh. or melt bits of ice. Just Has anyone, just out of curiosity, has anyone who's, who's watching this right now ever eaten horse meat? I haven't. I'm just wondering, like, is it any good? At least I don't. I don't think I. I don't think I, I. I'm pretty sure I would have remembered if I had eaten horse before. <laughs> I don't know why I was second guessing myself for a second there. I'm just used to second guessing myself, so that's just, that's just a thing. But uh, yeah, what does horse taste like? <laughs> it's not like there's like a ton of people who watch these videos, but in the off chance that one of the I don't know, 20 people who will watch this have ever eaten a horse. Let me know. <laughs> Thank you. Three weeks after leaving Moscow, a third of the army was dead or captured. About half the rest formed a growing army of stragglers, men without units, prepared to fight only to survive. Napoleon reached Smolensk on the 9th of November. The first troops into town ransacked the supply depots, leaving nothing for those who followed, including Ney's rearguard, which arrived six days later. Napoleon had hoped to make Smolensk his winter base, but the state of the army and lack of supplies meant the retreat had to continue. But the five days he spent there gave Kutuzov time to circle ahead and prepare an ambush. When the French retreat resumed, he struck 30 miles west of Smolensk at Krasny. What? Oh. In three days of desperate fighting through knee-deep snow, Napoleon used his Imperial Guard to hold open the road, as Eugène and Davout's corps fought their way through the ambush with heavy losses. Two regiments of the Young Guard were ordered to make a sacrificial counterattack to keep the Russians at bay were virtually annihilated. Kutuzov held back many of his troops and was blamed for not trying to destroy Napoleon's army when he had the chance. It's possible he was concerned at the number of raw conscripts in his own army, also suffering terribly in the freezing conditions. Every French corps broke through at Krasny. Marshal Ney and his 6,000 strong rearguard arrived on the 18th of November to find the road blocked by 60,000 Russian troops and no sign of the promised support from Davout's 1st Corps. Ney's men hurled themselves against the Russian lines with desperate courage, but were mown down. Rejecting several invitations to surrender, Ney led the survivors in a daring night crossing of the Dnipro River. Then across 45 miles of open country under constant attack from Platov's Cossacks to reach Osha. By the time Ney rejoined the army, his rear guard was down to just 800 fighting men, leading a column of several thousand stragglers. The army regarded his escape as a miracle and when Napoleon heard of it, he immediately dubbed Marshal Ney the bravest of the brave. God, I just like, I, I can't get over imagining just how miserable being in these conditions would have been. Like, I mean, war by itself is 
horrific. But then adding on top of it, this, this crazy brutal Russian winter and lack of supplies and food and like, I don't know. How, I can't imagine the, the clothing that they had was particularly effective. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I assume there, there was a lot of wool, right? With what they were wearing. Wool is pretty insulating, but like the, the keeping the feet dry, you know, we, we all know now you got to keep the feet dry and warm. And I, I can only imagine there was probably a lot of gangrene happening during this time period. Um, yeah, God, I just, my mind, my imagination goes all over the place when it comes to like, just imagining what these soldiers were having to live through, survive through, hopefully survive through. <laughs> Although most of them probably assuming that they were going to die. Like Jesus. Yeah. I don't have the mental fortitude to put myself in a situation like that. I mean, wh why would you want? Who would want to do that? Why? There's so much more to life. <laughs> anyway, I can go on and on. My mind can go uh, to many dark places, imagining what it was like. Uh, so let's just let's just keep moving on. This is beginning to be very... Oh. For some reason, I first read that as, this is the beginning to be very serious. I'm like, oh, oh, now you're taking it seriously? Yeah, okay. Napoleon had escaped one trap, but now three Russian armies were closing in from different directions and outnumbered him nearly three to one. From the east, Kutuzov's main army with 65,000 men. From the north, Wittgenstein, with 30,000, steadily driving back Marshal Victor's Ninth Corps. And from the south, Admiral Chichagov's Army of Moldavia, with 34,000, having detached General Ostenzaken with 30,000, to prevent Schwarzenberg's Austrians and Reynier's Saxon Corps marching to Napoleon's aid. Napoleon was heading for Minsk, a major French supply base with vast stores of the food, clothing, shoes and ammunition that his army so desperately needed. But on the 21st of November, disastrous news arrived. Minsk had fallen to Chichagov. He'd then marched on Borisov, driven out the Polish garrison and captured its bridge over the Berezina River. By rights, the Berezina ought to have frozen solid by now so Napoleon could have crossed anywhere. But a sudden thaw had turned the river into a torrent of ice and freezing water. Napoleon was at least joined by the hard-fighting Marshal Udino and his second corps, which hadn't suffered as badly as the main column on its retreat from Polatsk. Udino launched an immediate counter-attack on Borisov and retook the town, but couldn't stop the Russians burning the bridge. With no other bridge for miles in either direction, it seemed Napoleon's exhausted army was finally doomed. But there was one sliver of hope. Polish cavalry had found a ford across the river, near the village of Studienka, Napoleon issued a flurry of orders. Second Corps was to fake preparations for a river crossing south of Borisov. Victor's Ninth Corps, arriving from the north, was to form a rear guard east of Studienka to hold the Russians at bay, while engineers worked as quickly as possible to build pontoon bridges across the river and win Napoleon's army a fighting chance of escape.
On the afternoon of the 25th of November, General Eblay's Dutch engineers began building two 300-foot pontoon bridges across the Berezina River. They worked day and night, sometimes oh chest God. deep in freezing water, and completed both bridges in less than 24 hours. Few of the engineers Jeez. survived the ordeal. Yeah, no kidding. Do you think they drew straws as to who was going to be actually in the water? Oh, man. Ugh. You got to have real love for your country and your general to, to do that kind of shit. Oh, my God. I, I wouldn't even dip my foot in the in, in Lake Michigan right now. Like, no way. It's still too cold. <laughs> Chichagov had been totally fooled by the diversion south of Borisov and was moving his troops south to face it, allowing Napoleon's army to begin crossing its rickety bridges virtually unopposed. Udino's second corps led the way to secure a bridgehead, followed the next day by the remnants of the main army. Priority was given to formed troops, still able to fight. For the time being, the army's vast crowd of stragglers remained on the far bank. By the time Chichagov realised his mistake and began moving north, Napoleon had troops in place to defend the crossing. On the east bank, General Partonneur's 12th Division 4,000 relatively fresh troops from Victor's 9th Corps formed the rearguard. As Platov's Cossacks approached from the east, the vanguard of Kutuzov's main army, Partoneur tried to rejoin 9th Corps. But caught in a swirling blizzard, with visibility down to 50 metres, he marched straight into Wittgenstein's army. His entire division was killed or captured. The next morning, Chichagov and Wittgenstein launched coordinated attacks on both sides of the river. There was desperate fighting on the West Bank, where Marshal Udino was, yet again, seriously wounded, but his Swiss infantry held the line, until General Dumerck's cuirassiers the army's last heavy cavalry charged and routed the Russians. At great cost, Polish and German troops of Victor's rearguard held off the Russians until dark, then pulled back across the bridges. For two nights, officers had been trying to get the vast camp of stragglers to cross the bridges when they weren't being used. But with temperatures reaching minus 30 centigrade, they'd preferred to stay put, huddled around their fires. At dawn on the... Kind of looked like that one guy in the painting was, like, biting into the horse meat raw. See that? God. See, it's, it's, it's like paintings like this that are really just driving my, my imagination wild. Like, I just... Like, I understand a lot of these people were forced, you know, to fight. But there had to have been a, a few that were, you know, patriots, right? Nationalists uh, that wanted to fight for their country. But it just, it makes me think, like, god damn, like, for the people who did volunteer, did they really have nothing better going in their lives? I don't know, man. I just, like... My brain has trouble wrapping itself around the idea of of going to war, you know, killing people, risking your own life. Like, I get it, you know, if if there's like a legit reason, if you're defending, you know, your country or, you know, fighting for for uh, an underdog, I guess, or or someone who's being attacked, you know. But to be the aggressor, like just to go after another group of people for the acquisition of more land and power, wealth, like 
It's fucked up. To say the least. <laughs> yeah, man. I don't know. I, I've, I've talked too much on that. Let's keep going. Preferred to stay put, huddled around their fires. At dawn on the 29th, with the army leaving and the Russians approaching, thousands of stragglers surged in panic towards the bridges. Dozens yeah. were crushed underfoot. Others fell or were pushed into the water, or tried to swim, which was certain death. God. When French engineers burned the bridges at 9am, thousands were cut off and left to the mercy of the advancing Cossacks. Some became prisoners. Others were simply put out of their misery. Since the retreat began 43 days earlier, the Grande Armée had marched nearly 500 miles under constant attack, starved, exhausted, and for the last 23 days, in lethal sub-zero temperatures, without proper clothing or shelter. In that time, the fighting strength of the Grande Armée had been reduced from around 124,000 men to 20,000, mm. with as many stragglers still following the army. Shit. As the retreat continued to Vilna, the weather turned even worse, with temperatures falling to minus 37 degrees centigrade. The Russian armies at least now held back, leaving the winter, the Cossacks and Russian peasants to finish off the invaders. My hands are what what is the math like to calculate Celsius and Fahrenheit, or to calculate to to what do you call it? Change between one and the other. Because normally isn't there a bigger difference than two degrees between Celsius and Fahrenheit? That seems a little, a little odd. I just wanna nah. I I, I want to take the time to look that up, but just. We'll look it up on my own time. Anyway, that is still cold as shit, though. Negative 35, I can't even imagine. Oh, God. Like, you can't even be outside for, for like, more than, I don't know, 20 minutes max before you die? Like, how do they not all die at negative 35 degrees Fahrenheit? 37 Celsius for the... Europeans out there, the non-Americans, I guess. Do Canadians use Celsius? Any Canadians out there do you use Celsius? I, w I feel like America is the only one that just uses Fahrenheit and inches, feet, <laughs> just to just to be different, you know. On the fifth of December, Napoleon left the army, traveling incognito across Europe at breakneck speed and reaching Paris in just 13 days. Naturally, English satirists capitalized mm -hmm. on Napoleon, seeming to abandon his defeated army. I mean... And many soldiers did regard it as an act of betrayal. I, I probably would have felt the same way. His generals supported his decision to leave. There'd already been one attempted coup against Napoleon in Paris and there was much work to be done to rebuild the army and reassure France's allies. On the 9th of December, 51 days after the retreat began, around 20,000 ragged survivors of the Grande Armée began crossing the Nyman River back into friendly Polish territory. According to legend, Marshal Ney was the last man across. Napoleon's invasion of Russia had proved to be one of the greatest military disasters in history. He had made fatal miscalculations about geography, logistics, 
and above all, Russia's political and strategic response to his invasion. These blunders cost his empire around half a million men, as well as a quarter of a million horses and a thousand cannon. Put another way, of every 12 men who marched into Russia with the Grande Armée, one was killed in action or died of wounds. Two were taken prisoner, one of whom died in captivity. Seven died from disease or the effects of climate. Just two returned alive. That's... That is wild. That is just... Insane. I mean, I assume, you know, when they were going into war, they probably didn't think their odds were that bad, but... Ugh. Ugh. Yeah. When when going into situations like that, it's probably best to, to not know your odds. Ugh. God. Out of 12 people, two would survive. And for what? You know? Contrary to myth, many more soldiers had died in the summer advance from heat, typhus, and dysentery than were lost in the winter retreat. Oh. Russian military casualties were estimated at 150,000, and a huge but unknown number of civilian deaths. The Russian campaign was a catastrophe for Napoleon. Not just in lost troops and resources, but in damage to prestige and reputation. That winter, all his enemies sensed weakness, and prepared to join forces against him but the Emperor wasn't going down without a fight. Back in Paris, he admitted to his ministers, Fortune has dazzled me, gentlemen. I've let it lead me astray. Instead of following my plan, I went to Moscow. I thought I'd make peace there. I stayed too long. I've made a grave mistake, but I'll have the means to repair it. Thank you to all the Patreon supporters who make this series possible, and to our sponsor, World of Tanks. Don't forget you can download the game using the link in our video description to get special sign-up bonuses. If you'd like to support the channel and get free perks, including ad-free early access and exclusive production updates, please visit our Patreon page. All right. Well... I don't know, man. These last two videos, I just, in particular, it, it's just kind of, it's really hit me just how many, how many people were killed in this war, in, the, in this series of, series of wars? The Napoleonic Wars, right? But man, oh, I definitely need to break. I need a, uh, I need to watch something happy, I think. Definitely not going to get on social media. That's not the place to, to feel good about things. So, I don't know. What do you guys like to do to, to cheer yourself up or unwind? What's a good movie you like to watch that just makes you feel good? Hmm. Yeah, but I mean... This is very important stuff to to learn. I'm glad that I'm that this video series exists. And again, thank you to Epic History TV for putting this series together. Because I mean, if if you're watching this, I assume you know how important knowing history is. So yeah, I'm just, yeah. I I was debating for a second whether or not to repeat the 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 phrase. You know. Those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. You know, a very um, s seemingly obvious 
thing to to know and you know, like try to make an effort to to know your history right but i think more people could pay a little more attention right anywho man i don't know why this took so much out of me like i've watched several of these videos already it just there's something about today maybe just like the images like of the snow and battle and like we're already several months into winter here in chicago so like and I'm pretty tired of it, so winters can be pretty miserable, but just adding war on top of that and just... Ah. Yeah. But, like... There are a lot of things in, in the world today that can be improved and, and uh, lot, lots of really, really messed up things going on today, but... At least I have dry socks. I, I maybe I'll just leave it there. <laughs> um, yeah. All right. Well, if you're still here, thanks for sticking around. I appreciate you. I hope you enjoyed the video, and uh, be sure to like, share, and subscribe if you want to continue getting notified uh, about videos like this one. So yeah, thanks for sticking around, and uh, I'll see y'all next time.